I know that we see pain way differently here in North America versus like, um, you know, a, a, a native culture or a, an Aboriginal culture that, you know, has rites of passage where they have like huge spears put through their chest and, you know, like their perception of pain and my perception of a paper cut, you know, they might be equal, but yeah, they're, they're, you know, everybody does this differently. So yes, if we can look at, at that and see maybe the reasons behind it or see what else is going on in their world, then, ho- then hopefully we can get them to shift and surrender. Welcome, Trisha. Good morning, Robbie. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's it's great to see you here. I'm really curious to hear what got you interested in, in hypnosis for pain management. And you and I have known each other for many years, and I've always known that this was your specialty, but we've never really had this conversation. So uh, what what got you into this in the first place? Well, it was, uh, it was, is through a personal journey of needing to find a better solution for childbirth for myself. So after having two previous, uh, cesareans, I needed to find a way to wrap my mind around getting my body in alignment with, uh, natural childbirth. Um, because I believed I was able to, I found an amazing hypnotic childbirth program. I succeeded at having a natural birth after two cesareans, which is almost kind of unheard of. So, it kind of blew my mind at how effective it was. And, and once I knew how powerful the mind was and how hypnosis worked, it was, I just had to learn more. Awesome. And it is so amazing to discover this first through your own personal experience, because yeah. you, you know, you know what happens because you had the experience. So that's- yeah. And coincidentally, at the same time, I didn't only just achieve hypnotic childbirth uh, and a natural birth, I actually quit smoking with it as well. So it was like, it just it t- took it to the next level, because I never thought I would be able to quit smoking. And now I'm I'm 13 years smoke free, and, and I achieved something that I always wanted to do. So It really set the precedent for knowing exactly what the power of hypnosis was. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about generally how does hypnosis work for pain management? I think a lot of people don't, you know, it's kind of mysterious in terms of, you know, what actually happens. So so tell us a little bit about that. Okay. uh, Well, the biggest thing, whether it's hypnosis for childbirth or hypnosis for pain management is beginning to get the person to relax. Um, Usually what happens is something called the fear, tension, pain syndrome, where the anticipation of the pain and the remembered pain makes them uh, almost create it in the body automatically. So um, to give an example of this, like uh, with clients, I'll have them come in and I'll have them say, say the word pain 10 times. And we'll start pain, 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 pain. And like, even after I say it like five times, all of a sudden my lower back is hurting, you know, my neck is a little bit out. And the thing is, is the word pain on its own starts to manifest the idea of pain because of remembered pain. So as soon as you remember, it causes tension in the body. It changes the chemical responses in the body increases anxiety, which then causes more pain. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle. Um, so if we can stop that and actually have the person relax and then begin to actually calm the mind and the body, then the, the pain goes down. Um, so yeah, if you can get them to stop thinking about anticipating the pain before it even happens, that's the first step. So if you can relax the body, um, the very first step is always beginning with breathing. Um, most people who are in pain have all their muscles so clenched up and, and tense that they are, they're not even breathing properly. They're breathing shallow. So if we can teach them something like belly breathing, where they're actually taking in the full amount of oxygenation and like letting loose of the muscles of the body, then we can begin to help them calm down. Uh, the next steps are usually relaxing the body. Um, and of course, you know, we have like so many different ways to relax the body through through hypnosis. Sometimes we start at the toes. Sometimes we start at the top of the head. Um, sometimes we use muscle tightening. Um, but we have to relax the body. So first with the breathing, then we calm down the body, relax the body. Um, and then we're using either direct suggestion or indirect suggestion, uh, as well as maybe misdirection of the mind or shifting how they perceive the pain. Um, it 
there's a whole bunch of factors after the beginning part. But the truth is, is any pain client, any pain client will always do better with hypnosis in the first place because it relaxes them and we're controlling their breathing. And then we're giving their mind something to focus on other than the pain. So even without fancy hypnosis techniques for anesthesia or analgesia or um, anything to shift uh, the modalities or reframe how the pain is, um, they will do better. As soon as they start doing hypnosis, they will start doing better. Um, and that's a happy side effect. I'm sure you've seen it with weight, like weight loss clients, uh, not only removing the weight, um, but you know, just the hypnosis alone helps them learn how to relax, which therefore decreases their pain. I, I'm sure you can attest to that, right? For sure. And, and hey, I used hypnosis when I had both my kids too. And I think I remember like- that. Yeah, this was like 16 years ago before it was all the rage. So my, I had midwives and I had my kids at home in a birthing pool and my yeah. midwives who are, you know, alternative in the first place thought this was really alternative. So by the time I had my second child five years later, it had really taken off and become more of a mainstream thing. But I, you know, I definitely had my own experiences with that and I've, I've worked with a number of people as well. So, yeah. yeah. It's so funny that you mentioned about the midwives and stuff because I did have a midwife with the last one as well. So it was, again, education helped me knowing that there was better solutions for me to relax with. And I remember the midwife saying, that was one of the most beautiful births I've ever seen because people in hypnosis are so calm and relaxed and they react to the situation even in even more calmly. So yes, I, I think I remember that we both have that in common now that we're talking about it. It's been yeah. so long now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember the midwives being very impressed because they, they see so many births and they saw what happened with the use of hypnosis and they, you know, they, they've seen enough to know how it usually goes. So they, they're there. I wasn't one of those people who could get rid of the pain completely. I know some people can do that. I was definitely not one of them, but it, it sure made a difference and helped me, you know, focus and relax and all of that. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because actually that is a very big, um, that's a big aspect of pain management, whether it's with childbirth or with um, any, any kind of pain removal, is that we're not there necessarily, or uh, the tools aren't there necessarily to remove the pain. And each person has a different expectancy of what the, uh, the hypnosis is going to do for them. So for me, it was to achieve a natural birth and to be calm and in control and to actually see it all the way through. Um, other people, it is pain. They want pain-free or less pain. Other people, um, uh, even for like, if you think of a person who has like had severe issues in their, in their backs and their necks and like bone injuries and stuff, uh, you know, their, their goal isn't necessarily pain removal. And in fact, in that, in that instance, pain, complete pain removal would be, um, not beneficial for that person. Right. Um, so if they were say at an eight or a nine out of 10, and they were on heavy narcotics so that their brain was all foggy and they couldn't even think or they couldn't even drive, getting them down to a two where they knew the pain was there so that they couldn't per- cause injury, but it was just enough just to remind them where, where their their capabilities were, um, you know, that would be more reasonable for them rather than complete pain removal. And, and it's the same like with childbirth. Like I've had <laughs> I, I've had some moms who, um, the one mom in particular, she had had four, four births. This is her fourth birth and she did hypnosis for childbirth. And, uh, the births were just terrible. They were long, they were drawn out. And, and she's like, Trisha, I, like, I, this is my last baby. I, I really would like something better. Um, and she was so calm and so cool <laughs> when she was having her baby. Uh, and I was, a, it was a doula for her at the time. Uh, the nurses didn't believe her that she she was ready to push and have the baby. And they're like, no, 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 you're fine. And I'm like, no, 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 the baby is coming. The baby's coming now. You don't need to look. I just, you know, you could tell like the way she was breathing and everything, you know, and she got, we got her to, to where they wanted to deliver the baby. The doctor wasn't there. They didn't even phone and, you know, and the baby popped out and she's like, yeah, that was the best. That was the best birth ever. And part of it was, you know, because she learned how to, be relaxed in it. 
Um, another, another mom, you know, was so relaxed that she didn't remember to get out of the hot tub, you know, (laughs) but that wasn't my experience either. My experience was to achieve something I hadn't achieved before. So I can't say that it was pain free. Um, but the biggest thing with, with, uh, hypnotic childbirth is that they shift the, the sensations from pain to maybe more pressure or tension. And of course, if you think of the word pain in the beginning, when I was talking about connotation, uh, the word pressure has a way better connotation to the mind or uh, tension than the word pain. So as soon as they shifted that they were feeling, the, um, they would say, I was feeling tension or I was feeling pressure. All of a sudden, their whole nervous system changed because they had a better frame of reference for that word. So every sensation through hypnotic practice um, in the last two months of their uh, um pregnancy helped them shift how they perceived the sensations during birth. So, um, and that, that would be a very big key feature with hypnotic childbirth is that you need to remember that, um, you can't just do it once, uh, like lifting weights. You can't just lift a a weight once and get a beautiful muscle, right? You have to keep on lifting the weights. So the more they practice, it's like practicing an instrument. So, um, every time the baby say kicks, or they feel like a Braxton Hicks, they can begin to use their hypnotic tools to reframe in their mind uh, that that sensation is what they're going to feel during birth. Because, you know, everybody can tolerate, you know, the kicks and the Braxton Hicks and, you know, and they get through that. Nobody really complains too much. But uh, if they start shifting that that those are the sensations that they're going to feel during birth, then it is completely achievable to have a more comfortable childbirth. Um, but yeah, the goal is different for every single woman and everybody, every single pain management client and tempering expectations is a big part of getting success for the client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, um, I, what I've observed with clients is that getting people to have, you know, what we call selective awareness is is a big part of it as well, that, that you, you can choose to focus on feeling pain or pressure and make it a really big deal, or you can direct somewhere else. You can fixate somewhere else. So hypnosis involves repetition and fixation. And so tell us a little bit about like some examples of how you might use it that way. The normal fixation is um, what we call negating our way from success, right? So I I, I will go back to um, a childbirth again. So if you think of a lot of people who take these prenatal education courses and and they're told to uh, write out their birth plans, uh, and most of the time people uh, fix on, fixate on what they don't want, right? Um, and this was my downfall. I, I will admit, I said, I don't want a cesarean. I don't want an epidural. I don't want this. And I don't want that. And I don't want this. And this is literally becoming a menu of what I was creating in my world. So it's a lot, a lot like this. Uh, don't think about broccoli, right? Oops, there's the broccoli, right? So the thing is, is most people are negating their way from success. So they're thinking, I don't want to experience this and I don't want to have this pain and I don't want to have this pain. And so, yeah, they're they're fixating or using negative hypnosis, so to speak, on, on what they don't want. So if we can have the clients flip their attention and flip, flip their fixation on what they want to achieve rather than what they don't want, then, you know, they're going to achieve it Um, they're going to give their mind something else to focus on. And then through repetition and the relaxation, which is hypnosis, um, they can, they can get the results that they want. So if they say, I want to be calm and in control rather than I don't want to be in pain or I want to be comfortable and I want to breathe my way through, um, or I'm trying to think of another one. Um, I want to sleep better, which is a big thing with, uh, with hypnosis for pain management. If they're not sleeping, they're, they're very tense and they, they have a lower threshold of tolerance, right? So if they're, if they can say what they want rather than they don't want, it gives the mind like a seed, uh, that's planted. They're planting the seed of what they want to grow. So the more they say it, the more they begin to believe it, the more they begin to make it visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, the more they make it like a real, um, almost like a virtual image in their mind that they can step into, then they can, their brain perceives it as reality. Uh, so your brain doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. So the more that they 
they make this virtual image or the movie of their mind like uh, a real experience for them. Their mind perceives it as real. And it's like putting in that seed that that can grow. And so the next time that they experience it, their mind already has a full repertoire of exactly how they're going to behave and react. Right. So it, it's there. It's it's a, it's a, a computer program that in, was embedded and grew through actually using the mind to perceive it as real. Does that kind of answer your question or mm-hmm. what you wanted me to address? Yeah. And, and I, I'm, as you're talking about this, I, I'm recalling a client I, I helped with pain management and sleep and stress. And she was going through cancer treatment at the time, which is stressful. And she was told all of these side effects that might happen. And if she had these certain side effects, she had to go straight to the ER. And so she needed to be aware of the pain or the discomfort or what was going on with her body to take care of herself. And so we really helped her, uh, tune into that. And then as soon as she got to the ER, she would just go do some hypnosis and relax so that she could let it go. Right? Yeah. So I, one thing I've, I've observed is that it's helping people kind of work the levers of that, of knowing when the pain is a signal that they need to do something for themselves to take care of themselves. And when it's time to just let go and, and, you know, with childbirth, it's like an opening when you have a baby, if you're holding on, that baby's not coming out. And, and for those who've had children, that's a helpful metaphor. If you haven't, or you're a man, then you can just think of just the idea of surrender and letting go is what allows it to be easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that brought me back to um, another frame of reference. Yeah. So basically every time they think about all the negative things that can happen, whether it's with cancer treatment or if they're having surgery, Um, or in childbirth, if they're focusing on all the things that they were told could go wrong, then it's like, it's like putting in your order at the restaurant, (laughs) you know? So yes, you're right. You absolutely, um, education is an important component and learning, learning how things could change and understanding that those are possibilities and not being delusionally, um, optimistic, uh, it's not optimistic, but like delusionally positive where, nope, that's not going to happen to me. Isn't actually a good place to be, right? You actually want to know the potential things that could go wrong, but then you create the outcome that you desire to chase. So you're aware of it. It doesn't catch you off guard, but you are focusing on what you want rather than what you don't want. So yeah, cool. That was, that was a great story. That was helped me, help me remember something that was super important. <laughs> Well, and it really dovetails into where the scope of practice that we have is around pain management. So talk a little bit about that. Right. So first of all, the most important thing is that we do not deal with acute pain. Um, So acute pain, meaning like a sudden onset of stomach pain. So if a person came to you and they they said, uh, Robbie, my pain, my stomach, it just hurts so bad. Uh, that should be like a ding, ding, ding in any hypnosis mind going, yeah, nope, you need to go see a doctor because if, if they're suffering from acute appendicitis, you know, or some other problem with their stomach that hasn't been diagnosed and you remove the pain, well, that would be uh, deadly for the client, right? So uh, we never deal with acute pain. And then if a person does come for pain management, um, we do need a signed doctor's referral. So, and that's for the safety of the client. We need to make sure that whatever's been going on with them has been diagnosed and has been medically cleared and that the doctor has been made aware that they're looking for uh, different alternatives. Most of the time, the doctors are super, super excited that they're looking at alternatives rather than, uh, you know, more narcotics, right? Um, However, if the doctor isn't sure of what the diagnosis is, then then they might be like, nope, this isn't the right time for this. you know, once they get more testing or more information, then they can easily refer them back to us. Um, So we always want to make sure that we have a doctor's referral. Uh, So the things that we do work with is, um, of course, cancer patients, um, dental issues. Um, I haven't actually been in the dentist's office, but we can use hypnosis to help calm them and relax them and change how they feel about going to the dentist. Um, hypnotic surgery, again, it isn't in, in what I do, but there's great stories in history about hypnotic surgery and how powerful it is. Um, 
but we can help people before and after with both of those things, dental and, and surgeries, uh, cancer, um, even surrendering into what's going on, what, uh, whatever they need the surgery or the treatments for, helping them reduce the stress associated with that, um, maybe helping them sleep because you know they've been worrying so much about what's been going on. Um, and then chronic pain. So um, migraines, um, it, chronic back pain, maybe shoulder pain or nerve damage, all those kind of things we can help with hypnosis. Mm-hmm. So, so really, if, if you're feeling pain, it may be a signal that you need to do something to take care of your body, in which case you need to see your doctor. And once it's been diagnosed and we have a doctor sign off on the fact that they've been fully checked out and there's nothing else that medically they can do or they're being taken care of that way, with hypnosis, you can just be more comfortable. You can help the person manage what's going on better. <clears throat> yeah, manage or in some cases, like totally make give them their life back. Like I remember there was a 19 year old uh, girl and she was suffering from migraines so severely uh, and the migraine medication that she had to take really debilitated her. She was a hairdresser and, you know, she was under like, the bright lights and, you know, she had to stand on her feet. And as soon as she took that medication, she, she had to be in a dark room and laying down and, and it, it just changed her life. She couldn't even drive or anything. Right. So once she had learned the hypnosis, <clears throat> she could usually actually get rid of the migraine before it even began, or even make it so dull that she didn't have to take any medication other than like Tylenol or Advil. Right. So it, it actually gave her whole, her whole life back. Um, and another client, like she had such severe uh, nerve issues, like her whole body was so sensitive. She was like um, an eight or a nine out of 10. Um, all the time, I remember shaking her hand back when we could <laughs> shake people's hands and, and greet each other. Um, but she burst into tears as soon as I shook her hand. <clears throat> And she couldn't even function at her day job, just like typing, you know, what wasn't even an option. And as soon as she learned um, literally some instant techniques that she could literally drew, do kind of like at the drop of a finger, um, it, everything changed. And she'd keep uh, 0.5 out of 10. So less than one. Uh, and if it got any, any more than that, uh, she'd literally do her instant hypnosis techniques Um, and it would just disappear again. It was, it was, it was really magical to see how it gave her life back, but with chronic pain, absolutely. Sometimes it's just, you know, just getting them to live in a better way. Um, but those are two really cool stories where either the medications they were on or, or the pain they were experiencing was so debilitating they couldn't even function. So usually when people come for hypnosis, it's, it's almost a last resort. They've tried all the other medical things. Um, and so, uh, and that's, that does increase the effectiveness, right? Cause the, they're, there's in such, um, need of something to work better that, you know, their expectancy of making it want to work, um, it really magnifies the results. So yeah. yeah I know. And you're, you're reminding me of a client I had a while back and he was actually a, a pharmaceutical representative for his whole career. And yeah. then as he got older and he retired. He developed some uh, a, a condition where he had very severe pain and he came for hypnosis and it was like a miracle. Like it was gone. He knew how to make it go away completely. So he was like floored because here he worked for pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> which is totally the opposite but it shows you the range of what's possible where some people really can just it, it miraculously make it go away, even if there's real physical pain and other people have more, uh, they, they can be more comfortable, but the, the difference isn't as dramatic. So I think it's important for people to be aware of that range and we're going to help people take it as far as they can. Um, mm-hmm. of course, because we want it to be as good as it can. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of run it the same as like, stop smoking. Like I, you know, I, I, I throw out like several different ideas of how potentially this could help them, uh, so that I temper their expectations. So it's not an all or nothing thing. And that's, you know, that, that brings me to like one of the most important things about doing, um, hypnosis sessions for pain management is first that you need to temper their expectations and give them like a rainbow or like a, you know, 10 degrees of options, right? So you could, maybe you're just going to sleep better, or maybe you're just going to be so much more calm or in control, or maybe 
your pain can almost entirely disappear, or maybe we can reduce it by half. And so we kind of like throw all these different ideas like spaghetti on the wall and, you know, one of them might stick, but at least it's not an all or nothing type of thing. So, um, and then the second most important thing in a pain management session, well, actually in all hypnosis sessions, and I'm sure you're going to attest to this, is that they have to know that they were hypnotized, right? So, if they, if they think they were just laying there relaxing, well, that we're doing them a disservice, right? So we have to have some marker of uh, proving the hypnosis to them, uh, as well as I, I always recommend starting the session knowing where they're really at on the pain scale, uh, say zero to 10, right? So that's the most common uh, framework. Um, I actually like to expand it to zero to 100 because it gives them more opportunity to see a change. So if the person said they only saw a, like a one point change, their brain perceives that as meh, okay, right? But if you say a 10 or 15% change, all of a sudden the brain does something different. It's kind of cool. So in the beginning, I'll ask them, okay, rate their pain on a scale of zero to 10, and then I'll shift it to this hundred scale. And then I'll get them to, uh, alleviate or alleviate, uh, to completely take away the word pain. Um, so remember in the beginning when I was saying the word pain, 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 and how we make that happen in the body, I actually tell all pain clients that they need to shift the word to discomfort. So pain becomes a dirty word. Imagine it like your mother's going to wash your mouth out with soap, right? So you're not allowed to say it, or you have a swear jar. And every time you say that, you know, you got to put a dollar in. So you're not allowed to say the word pain anymore. And they kind of look at me and I'm like, okay, so now rate your discomfort on a scale of zero to 10. And it's, it's very interesting. They actually have done studies um, in pain management awards where one nurse was allowed to say, rate your pain on a scale of zero to 10. And one was say, able to say, rate your discomfort on a scale of zero to 10. And the one who said discomfort gave out half as much or way less pain medication than the other one, right? Just because of that word con connotation. So remember the root word in discomfort is comfort. So it's actually a direct suggestion to the brain to create a better frame, Right. So as soon as they start saying that, it's really interesting that their pain starts going down so that in like halfway through the session, you could again ask the, the client where they're at and then tie idiomotor response or acceptance to having the number go even further, right? And so you have that marker before in the middle and then at the end of the session to see, so see where the change is at. Um, but if you don't do that, then there's no frame of reference. Well, where, where was I really at the beginning of the session? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, make sure that you temper expectations, uh, number two, that you actually prove that they were in hypnosis and number three, make sure that you have a marker of success so that you actually know that they achieved a change and then teaching them light, uh, that the more they practice, the stronger this will get is not only embedded suggestion that they're going to get better and better at this, uh, and that they can achieve greater results, but it helps them uh, actually have something to chase. Mm -hmm. So the, it's really, if, if somebody wants to grab on to making it a certain way, it's going to make the discomfort worse because there's intensity around that. So a lot of this is about letting go and surrendering. And, and one way to look at it is like, um, just it, it, it unfolding or it, it, uh, spreading out like just the like if you look at throwing a rock in water and the rings spread more and more every time they have some evidence that they're making progress it helps them make even more progress and so I think that's a really useful way to yeah. for people but I I found that some clients who need this help and really help in general um really like to be in control and and maybe the first time in their life that something's happening that they they're not perceiving they can control and so there's a whole shift in their their they need to discover a new way of interacting with life and what happens and and surrendering into acceptance so it goes beyond the actual pain it's it's like a whole way of looking at things and a way of feeling about what happens right Absolutely. Yes. Acceptance is huge. And then, and then having like at least three creative options of how to do it better. Right. So that they're not getting stuck on just one idea. Um, so they are discovering or becoming curious about multiple solutions. And I think that's probably the framework that we use for all of our sessions uh, in general. Right. So basically you can, you can, yeah, 
our whole job is getting people to level or surrender into what's really going on in the world so that they can be architect of how they want their life to go, right? Um, I use the analogy um, Google Maps a lot. Uh, so yes, we have to you know put in the destination that would be ideal, right? But uh, most people say they wanted to go from Toronto to Calgary. Uh, they'll put in Calgary, you know, in, in in the destination bar, but most people forget to press go, right? So they're just like this blue dot scrolling around on a screen. Um, but as soon as they press go, of course, it auto populates at least three routes how to get there. So that's kind of like the reverse engineering of, of how, how you want to create your life, right? So you have a destination, but what if halfway to Calgary, you decide to go to Saskatoon? No big deal. Or, you know, maybe you're going to go to Florida because it's warm and sunny. <laughs> Who knows? But, you know, you can't, as long as you set a destination, you, it, it doesn't matter if you get off track and, you know, knowing that there's multiple different options uh, to helping them surrender, or accept the world that they're in is, is a big part of the, of any process, whether it's weight loss, stop smoking, stress, uh, and pain, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the students here, she had this experience before she even learned hypnosis where she, she was in a car accident and she broke her back. And so she was in rehab and dealing with the physios and the doctors and, and disability insurance. And it was really interesting to hear what her experience was with that because it sounded like the doctors and the physios were trying to get her to report the pain as being worse than it actually was because they wanted her to get disability. And very smartly with it, before she even new hypnosis, she realized that that would be a bad idea for her. And she said, forget it, I'm going to make my own money. And I'm going to report this as it is, because I don't want to feel worse than I actually feel. And I right. think a lot of people get stuck in that trap of, of fixating on something that's going to make them worse. Um, sometimes it's people uh, feeling like if they get better, they're going to lose attention from their family or they're going to have to go back to work or things like that. Um, oh my gosh, so yeah. do, do you have some examples of where you've seen that with your clients? Well, the biggest example I think was you know, ironically, one of the ones our, our master trainer, Scott McFall, mentions all the time about uh, a, a gentleman who had a cane. And, you know, when he was having fun with him, you know, he was in the mall or something, I think. And, you know, all of a sudden the, the guy had left his cane, you know, uh, oh, and then all of a sudden the woman ran up to him and said, oh, here, honey, you forgot your cane, you know. But the thing is, is, yeah, there's always there's there's some very big reasons why people hold on to the pain forever. Um, and there's like some kind of secondary benefit that they're getting from it, whether it's a paycheck or um, I had one lady, it, you are reminding me of a lady who had uh, daily headaches, daily. I mean, and, and she was like basically in bed all the time. And um, before that, she was uh, she was always running around. She was like always taking care of everybody. Uh, her husband was always gone. And and when she got the headaches, all of a sudden, you know, her kids started paying attention. Here, mom, here's a cup of tea. And um, all of a sudden, the husband was home in the evenings. And, you know, her whole world changed. And she actually never let go of the headaches. And I, you know, one could speculate perhaps that it was because now her life was actually better. She was actually she wasn't solely responsible for everybody in the house. And if she would have let go of that, she was scared that it was going to go back to the way that it was before. It was, yeah, it was, I, I remember being devastated with that, that um, because I couldn't get her to surrender into seeing the bigger picture of the benefit that she was getting from, from keeping the pain. Um, <clears throat> and I think she, she would rather have the pain than the loss of the connectivity that she had gained. Um, and there was no way that I could make her secure enough to see the, the bigger picture in that. So, yeah, that does remind me of, of that particular story. But it, it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and it could have just been that I was like too young in my career <laughs> to know how to get her to level in a different way. Um, but, yeah, th there's often reasons why people are holding on to it. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely like a badge of honor for some people. Um or sometimes there's other people in their life that are suffering as well. Um, and it, you know, serves as a distraction for that person, right? So um, there's lots of different reasons that the perception of pain is so different for different cultures. Um, 
for women versus men, um, just how they were raised. Um, I know that we see pain way differently here in North America versus like, um, you know, a, a, a native culture or a, an Aboriginal culture that, you know, has rites of passage where they have like huge spears put through their chest and, you know, like their perception of pain and my perception of a paper cut, you know, they might be equal, but yeah, they're, they're, you know, everybody does this differently. So yes, if we can look at, at that and see maybe the reasons behind it or see what else is going on in their world, then, ho- then hopefully we can get them to shift and surrender. Yes. I bet. That was a very good point made. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah. And, and the stories, you know, I've heard the stories of people who, you know, on the battlefield when they don't have anesthetic and they need to amputate somebody's arm or leg and the person's in horrible pain and there's nothing they can do. Miraculous things happen when they use hypnosis because they need it so bad. So there is an aspect to this where the degree of need determines the degree of hypnosis and the degree to which the person can experience the the shift and, and letting go of that discomfort. So, which is pretty interesting. I mean, it shows you what our minds are capable of. And, and if you look at that example and, and act as if that's what you're going through, even if you're not, it can actually make your results better in the end. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm so glad we're not amputating on in, in fields anymore, but yes, that it is, it is pretty amazing what the mind can accomplish, like to have a waxy catatonic state where, yeah, they can do surgery and, and the person feel completely comfortable. But again, you know, that, that it brings also, not only that was the need so great, but also the belief system of people. Most of the stories are in, in a culture that had a higher belief system and, you know, like they, they focused on outcomes. Um, so I think it, it's really interesting instead of analyzing it, you know, looking at what, what results they want instead of uh, dissecting, so to speak, um, potential outcomes they're focusing on on what they needed at that time so that that that's magical yeah yeah so can you share with our listeners some things they can start doing right now to help themselves with pain and discomfort right so yes um the (laughs) the fastest and easiest thing people can do is start to breathe um if they can change their breathing where they're taking a big breath in and most people take a big breath in and they raise their shoulders and their, their shoulders goes up to their ear and they're re- breathing in the top part of their chest. But if we can teach them to breathe, uh, do what's called belly breathing, where they're taking a deep breath and really letting the bottom of the diaphragm expand. So they're, they're blowing up their belly instead of their chest. They're actually breathing right down into the bottom of their lungs. <clears throat> and we'll usually find that if they can just actually begin with the breathing, then they can, uh, th- that releases the tension in the body which calms the mind, which reduces that fear, tension, pain cycle. And then if we can begin to focus the mind on something, um, you know, maybe, maybe something that really excites them or something that calms them so much, maybe them, you know, the coolest scene that they can imagine, um, something that, flows, you know, even thinking of water or having their breath become like Novocaine or anesthetic, um, they, they can bring that breathing and breathe the comfort to where they need it to go. Um, so breathing is hands down, probably the, the quickest thing people can do. Um, and then the next thing that people can do is something I call, um, first aid hypnosis, um, where they're changing the words and, and, using suggestions so that they can create what they want to have happen. Um, now, obviously if we're in a traumatic situation, you know, it, it, it's, it's delusional to think that, you know, everything's perfect and rosy, but if they want to at least be calm and in control, they first have to decide that's where they're going and then, you know, state it and you use, um, make it like, like I said, that virtual image in the mind where it's, it's not just, it's not just a picture. It actually has sight and sound and touch and smell and, you know, like actually have them really transform them, their mind into going into this virtual image that they can create comfort in. Um, a lot of the time, how, how you, if you, 
if you're having traumatic um, pain in real time because of an injury, the biggest, most powerful thing, another uh, another thing that people can do is actually cover it up. <laughs> um, and that, that when I used to work in the medical field, that that helps people the most because then they weren't looking at it and focusing on it and, and stressing over what was in front of their eyes. Um, if you cover it up, you can then shift their mind into something else. So, um, so like, thinking, like nobody likes giving blood, right? You look the other yeah. way. <laughs> so I used to be my job. So yeah, that was the biggest thing. And and then same with like taking x-rays. Um, I found like a lot of the people would focus on the story of what had happened to them. Um, and, and this is another really important fact is that every time you retell a story, um, it changes. So what we remember isn't real. Um, every time you replay it, it becomes like a fish story. Do you know what I mean when I, when I say a fish story? <laughs> so like if I, I think of like old men when they go and they catch these fish and they come back. And every time you hear the story, the fish is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, it's getting more and more intense, right? And, and the thing is, is people change their stories, even though they are not aware of it, based on the reactions they're getting from the people around them. So if it's not actually eliciting the mood that they want or the sympathy or whatever, they'll change the story. And if they start to tell the story many different ways, all of a sudden the story is completely different from what they perceived in the first place. So um, it, for, for that hypnotic first aid, like if, if when I was working with clients in the medical system, if they were ex had just had this trauma happen, instead of spending the time talking to them about what, ha what happens, which would just make it bigger and it, they'd actually get more uncomfortable on the table in front of me, I would actually, A, cover it up so that they are no longer looking at it and then begin to focus their mind on how they wanted it to go or like uh, how, how we could, you know, get some comfort in their, in their body. Um, so that um, using, using the tools of changing to things to how they want it to be, or at least how to make it better um, is definitely an important feature in, in things that people can do right now for pain. And if they can relax their body with some form of relaxation, either from head to toe or toe to head, you know, with the breathing, they're going to create a huge change in, in a short period of time. Great. Well, thanks, Trisha. I think there's so much great information and tips for people here. Um, so I really appreciate you coming. I learned a lot from listening to you and, and all of your wisdom and insight about this. Um, tell people how they can get in touch with you. Uh, probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is, is to phone. Um, and it's 403-33-HYPNO or 403-334-9766. And then the email address is super easy, hypnosisab, as in Alberta, hypnosisab at gmail.com are probably the two fastest and easiest ways to get a hold of me. Great. All right. Well, it was great to have you here. And, Thanks for um, me. Yeah. And so Trisha is my colleague. She also trains hypnotists. So um, she works in Alberta and we're in Ontario. But these days with everything online, it's all over the place. Um, so if you want more information, you can contact Trisha. You can also get in touch with me at hypnosistrainingcanada.com to find out more about how you can learn hypnosis to help yourself or build an exciting career as a hypnotist. You may have been wondering if hypnosis is a good career and whether hypnotists are in demand. Perhaps you're curious about how much money a hypnotist makes. On next week's podcast, hypnotist Julie Neese will share her experiences of building three busy hypnosis clinics. Her insights will help you decide if hypnosis is a good career for you. If you are wanting to discover more about how hypnosis training can help you, go to hypnosistrainingcanada.com and schedule your free consultation. Remember to click the button to subscribe, share this podcast with a friend, and please leave us a review so you can help others to benefit from the podcast too. Until next week. You've been listening to The Hypnosis Show with Robbie Spear Miller. Tune in next time to learn more about how you can change your life with hypnosis. And if you are interested in learning more about training opportunities, go to hypnosistrainingcanada.com and schedule a free consultation.